Okay, good evening, everyone. My name is Michelle Galazuski. I'm a Partner Relations Director with Eversight. And on behalf of everyone at Eversight, I would like to thank you for joining tonight's program, Assessing Prevalence of SARS-CoV-2 in Human Postmortem Ocular Tissues and the Impact of Routine COVID-19 Testing for Cornea Donors. In an effort to eliminate all background noise, all participants will be muted throughout the duration of the webinar. If you would like to ask a question, you may do so by typing your question into the Q&A panel at the bottom of your screen. We will address all questions at the end of the webinar. At this time, I would like to introduce our speakers for this evening. As Director of Research at Eversight, Ankar Savant is responsible for all research and development activities, in addition to leading the Eversight Center for Vision and Eye Banking Research, located in Cleveland. Dr. Savant received a doctorate in biomedical sciences and a master's in biotechnology from Texas A&M University. He completed a postdoctoral fellowship at the Cleveland Clinic Cole Eye Institute and was named an emerging vision scientist by the National Alliance for Eye and Vision Research. Michael Titus joined Eversight in 2017. He is the former ch chief clinical officer of Saving Sight and I bank in Kansas City, Missouri, where he successfully crafted the strategic direction of its clinical program, oversaw lab renovations, and improved tissue quality and surgeon satisfaction. Prior to his time at Saving Sight, Titus excelled in various roles with Eversight from 2008 to 2013, including managing the laboratory in Michigan and playing an instrumental role in developing the Eversight DMEC program. He is a certified iBank technician and currently serves on the iBank Association of America Research Committee and Accreditation Board. Ankar, you can go ahead and begin. Thanks, Michelle. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we like to start all of our presentation with our mission statement. Our mission is to restore sight and prevent blindness through the healing power of donation, transplantation, and research. All right, uh, let's get started and talk about some data on COVID-19 and SARS-CoV-2 virus. Uh, so I don't think so uh, we need this introduction anymore, but SARS-CoV-2 abbreviation has come from a virus that named as Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2, uh, which causes coronavirus disease, hence the name COVID-19. Uh, many of you know that of the person who first reported the outbreak in Wuhan in China, uh, Dr. Wen Liang was an uh, ophthalmologist uh, who saw some of the signs and symptoms related to previous coronavirus outbreak. Since then, uh, many research have shown that SARS-CoV-2 entry protein and receptors are expressed within the different regions of the eye especially the one shown here, uh, these images here are from the human uh, cornea as shown here uh, for the ep epithelial layer, uh, marked with ACE2 and TMPRSS2 receptor uh, shown in green and red fluorescence respectively. Uh, the panel on the right is the overlay uh, stained with nuclei stain as well. As you can see, the epithelial layer here shows the expression of both ACE2 as well as TMPRSS2 receptor, making cornea could be susceptible for virus entry. Since the beginning of pandemic, number of uh, reports have shown number of studies have shown that ocular manifestation is observed and the virus particle has been found in tears, conjunctiva, retina, as well as trabecular meshwork and iris. So after pandemic had started, uh, based on iBank Association of America and CDC guidelines, as well as FDA regulations, uh, Eversight was ruling out number of surgical tissues from surgical path and they were used for research. We took all those tissues and divided them into three different categories. All these tissues were eliminated because of there was some concern related to COVID-19. Uh, we took this tissue and classified them in three different groups. Group one was symptomatic cases uh, asymptomatic cases which had positive COVID-19 test. Group two 
for somebody that was symptomatic, had related signs and symptoms of COVID-19, but their test result was negative, but we still rule out those cases based on their signs and symptoms. And third is somebody that had spent some close contact with COVID-19 patient. Uh, the detail about how this classification was done will be covered by Mr. Michael Titus on the second half of this presentation. So for now, uh, let me explain you how we analyze all this tissue. So as I mentioned, we divided these, all these different tissue in three different groups. Uh, for group one, we had 18 cases. Group two, we had 13 cases. And for group three, we had two cases at the time of this analysis was done. Uh, we took both left and right cornea, uh, corneal scleral rims from these cases and separated sclera from the cornea and isolated RNA from sclera as well as cornea. So all together, we had about 36 samples for group one. Group two, we had 26 samples of each sclera and cornea. And for group three, we had four samples. So out of all these samples for group one, six out of 36 tissue actually showed presence of SARS-CoV-2 RNA by real-time qPCR assay. And then four out of 36 corneal samples from group one had presence of uh, virus RNA. On other side, group two had respectively three and four samples being tested for sclera and cornea that showed presence of the virus. Uh, obviously, because of small sample size or some other criteria, we did not see any positivity for group three. So as you can see, uh, both taken together for group one and group two, the positivity rate was somewhere around uh, in a ballpark of 10 to 15%. And these positivity rate has been similar to what has been shown by clinical manifestation of uh, SARS-CoV-2, where some of the patients had conjunctivitis and other ocular surface manifestation. So as this data that we, I just showed you was from either asymptomatic positive donors or symptomatic negative donors, what we had, uh, we didn't analyze initially was data from uh, donors that were symptomatic as well as positive for COVID-19. So we, our goal was to determine the prevalence of this virus within these cohort of donors. So what we did, uh, we analyzed data on 10 COVID-19 donors. So all these donors were tested positive on pre-mortem testing. Also, they had classic COVID-19 signs and symptoms. So for these 10 donors, uh, at the time of recovery, uh, we performed a nasopharyngeal swab for the purpose of performing post-mortem PCR testing. We also took the blood sample so we could run ELISA assay to detect IgG and IgM antibodies within these donors. Uh, so hence, we could validate the status of their pre-mortem testing. So after these blood samples and nasopharyngeal swabs were collected, one eye was recovered by following traditional eye banking practices uh, according to EDAA guideline, where we use 5% uh, povidone iodine or uh, betadine uh, after double soak procedure. The other eye was recovered without any disinfection. So our goal here was to detect the prevalence of SARS-CoV-2 with and without betadine soak procedure. So after the corneal scleral rim excision, uh, we, we, we collected different swabs from uh, anterior as well as posterior layer of the cornea, as well as vitreous and conjunctiva. After swabs were collected, we took the remaining tissue and added that into a form aldehyde solution and then that tissue was further used for immunostaining for SARS-CoV-2 spike and envelope protein. So here's the summary from all the 10 donors that we had. As I mentioned, all 10 donors were tested positive on pre-mortem testing, as you can see here in the second column. Uh, our, our goal was to detect the virus within the eye during first peak phase of the uh, COVID-19 disease. So all the donors that we selected for this study were within first 15 days. 
to make sure the viral load was maximum during in the their respiratory system so we could catch the virus in the ocular system as if it's present. So for the postmortem testing, as you can see in the second last column, out of 10, six donors were tested positive on postmortem testing. And for postmortem IgG results, uh, eight out of 10 donors had positive IgG results. So the two donors that did not have positive IgG uh, perhaps have not had zero conversion. As you can see, they were tested positive for pre as well as postmortem uh, nasopharyngeal swab testing. And then four donors that did not test positive at the postmortem, perhaps they were later during their progression and the viral load might have decreased. But at the same time, they were confirmed cases because their IgG results were positive. So all uh, this 10 donor, we divided the tissue, as I mentioned earlier, in conjunctiva, a swab from anterior cornea, uh, which is for epithelial layer, swab from posterior cornea, which is for endothelial layer. And then also we took swab from vitreous. And then we divided these in two groups uh, without uh, povidone iodine treatment and with the treatment. As you can see, uh, we saw uh, the positivity rate somewhere around 10 to 15 percent ballpark range. Uh, the one important thing that I want to mention here for the anterior cornea and posterior cornea, which is most affected by the betadine or povidone iodine double suck procedure, we saw higher positivity rate for the blue bar, which is without any disinfection treatment. Uh, so which was very interesting and promising finding for us, showing that uh, treating uh, donor tissue with betadine is significantly important. On the other hand, it, the one uh, curious finding for us is that posterior corneal swab were somehow were testing at higher rate. We couldn't understand still what is the mechanism of this is. Uh, but to answer this question, we also collected iris from remaining donors, uh, but we did not see any positivity for any of the iris sample uh, that were collected from these donors. So the next uh, information that I want to show you is about the spike and envelope protein. So data that I just showed you for the QRT-PCR is detecting the virus RNA, which is present here uh, at the center of the virus. Uh, the virus, this is the just representative cartoon, but has spike and envelope protein that helps the virus in transmission process, uh, but not, but it doesn't uh, confirm the transmissibility of the virus just by detecting this protein. So for envelope protein, uh, we label the uh, our tissue sections, which were frozen after 4% PFF uh, fixation. So as you can see here, this data on this slide is from the cornea that were collected without any uh, PVPI treatment. So the top panel here is from the antibody control where we did not add any primary antibody for envelope protein, only secondary antibody was added just to make sure there is no background noise that is giving the false positivity. Uh, panels, uh, the second panel here is from a healthy control uh, that was known uh, COVID-19 control and did not have any infection and were tested negative as well. And then here is one representative example uh, shown here, pointed by this arrow, uh, showing uh, red immunofluorescence, basically identifying the uh, envelope protein within the epithelial layer of the cornea. Similarly here, this data is from the same donor, uh, but labeled with the spike protein. As I mentioned earlier, uh, top panel is antibody control, middle panel is from healthy uh, patient. And then you can see the puncta staining shown here in red, uh, show that uh, this donor cornea had presence of spike protein. And then when we took the other eye, which was recovered by after following uh, betadine double soak procedure, we did not see any, see any detectable levels of protein. Uh, so what this data really signify is uh, the double exposure betadine procedure might be helping uh, to clear the virus particle from the eye. 
So in summary, what our data shows that there is a small, about 10 to 15 percent uh, prevalence rate of SARS-CoV-2 RNA and some protein, uh, envelope protein and spike protein within the donors that died from COVID-19. Uh, our data also highlights that donor screening guidelines is very important because that's one way to eliminate any donor that might be potentially harboring any tissue. Uh, Post-mortem nasopharyngeal PCR testing is something we definitely recommend. And I know Michael Titus has more data on that, but this helps us to eliminate the tissue that might be carrying any virus RNA. And then uh, we really need to continue thorough disinfection protocol that ha we have been already doing to make sure that the virus is not getting trans, uh, virus particles are not present. Uh, so this is the data we have so far. I just kind of want to highlight this data does not show anything about the transmission of the virus. All this shows that virus particle might be present and we need to continue doing uh, thorough screening, uh, post-mortem testing and disinfection. Uh, and with that, I would like to mention that these findings are now published in the Ocular Surface Journal and being available since November. Uh, and would also like to highlight that our work was picked up by a few uh, outlets and they are uh, mentioned here. With that, I will pass on to Michael for the next part. Thank you. Thank you, Ankar. Great. Thank you, Ankar. And share my slides here. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time uh, just talking about the uh, patient safety and Eversight's response to SARS-CoV-2 in the donor pool. Uh, patient safety is primary concern and uh, focused effort of all of the work that we do. And so I wanted to just uh, highlight how these times have kind of changed some of our approaches and processes and what we've done to address some of that. Uh, again, background uh, may not be as necessary anymore, January 22nd, the first confirmed case was in the US. January 24th, only two days later, we had the first confirmed case in our service area of Illinois. I did want to highlight that on March 2nd of 2020, the iBank Association of America released its first guidelines for iBanks in uh, handling COVID criteria and donor eligibility. And on June 1st of 2020, Eversight began postmortem PCR testing on all donors. Uh, there is some potential for SARS-CoV-2 transmission, as Onkar just uh, went over. Uh, there have been several studies that have shown the virus or remnants of the virus in ocular tissues. Uh, and most uh, recently, the work that uh, we did and was published in Ocular Surface. Uh, however, there are no known reports of SARS-CoV-2 transmission through transplantation, through cornea transplantation. Uh, so uh, we are taking a conservative approach here, but uh, SARS-CoV-2 is a bit unlike other coronaviruses and is a bit unlike uh, viruses that we've seen in the past. So we're being very cautious and conscientious about patient safety and recipient safety in cornea transplantation. Uh, as I mentioned, the EBA guidelines were established by the Medical Advisory Board and first released March 2nd of 2020. Those guidelines have been updated regularly throughout uh, this time period as new data has come out and as uh, more clinical findings really begin to shed light on the effects and impacts of the virus on uh, the donor pool and on, also on uh, recipients. Uh, the most recent guidelines have been updated, were updated October 20th. And these are all really based on uh, the testing status of the donor, the signs and symptoms, recent signs and symptoms of the donor, and any close contact with potential uh, known carriers or known people, uh, patients with infections. Uh, and put the chart up here just to give an idea of kind of some of the different things that we're, we're looking for here. Uh, one of the, the interesting things about this virus has been that the signs and symptoms are, are so prevalent in so many donors' history uh, that we've had over the past many years, right? These are not unusual findings. 
that we find in, in the donor pool, headache, sore throat, cough, uh, congestions, pneumonia, pulmonary uh, issues. These are all very common findings for our donor pool. And so our, our work has really been to kind of identify uh, these findings, these signs and symptoms that are uh, among potential uh, donors and rule those out and also try to rule in as much tissue as we can while ensuring patient safety so that we do have tissue still available for transplantation. Um, and then there's a, there's a chart that is available on the EBA website. I put the link here uh, if you would like to read some more about it or look at it a little more closely. Uh, but really with all of these different kinds of variations, we come up with 17 uh, really real variations here where um, kind of the way that they, those all signs and symptoms and uh, testing status work together, uh, we end up with four eligible options, uh, five that need, require medical director review and uh, eight that are not eligible. Uh, and so uh, Eversight is compliant with all of the EBA recommendations. We do stay up to date on all of the regulatory uh, changes either by the EBAA or the FDA through our uh, phenomenal Q, uh, QA team and our COVID task force. And I uh, did want to talk about uh, the post-mortem testing as well. There we go, sorry about that. Uh, it's, as uh, testing options became more broadly available, supplies became more broadly available, uh, we were in con continuous communication with our medical directors and they approved uh, post-mortem testing as an additional tool to screen donors and screen for recipient safety. Uh, our recovery teams begin nasopharyngeal swabs of donors, of all donors, beginning June 1st of 2020. And this applied to any donor who had not been tested within 72 hours from the time of death, perhaps in the hospital or in the clinic. Uh, donors with a positive test or an inconclusive test are deemed ineligible. And primarily all of our testing is performed at Eurofins VRL laboratories in Denver, Colorado. Uh, some, some cases and in some instances we do testing at our OPO uh, sites, uh, but primarily all of our testing is done at VRL. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the cornea donor pool and the role of post-mortem testing. Uh, this is a study that was presented at the Cornea and Eye Banking Forum on November 7th. Uh, here are the authors and co-authors of, of this work. And this was supported by the targeted research grant on COVID-19 by the EBAA. The purpose really is to identify the extent to which EBA guidelines and eye bank restrictions uh, impact the corneal supply at single eye bank being Eversight during the COVID-19 pandemic and to explore the, the utility of routine post-mortem testing of all potential donors. So this was a single eye bank study. It was just the data that we were uh, had access to through our, our own database. It's a retrospective analysis covering February 1st through June 30th. So kind of getting that initial impact of the uh, pandemic uh, through kind of when things started to get back to somewhat of normal. Uh, and we used the, uh, the same time period uh, the year prior, 2019, as a control period. And donors ineligible due, uh, due to EBA guidelines and also to our iBank specific restrictions uh, were included in the, in the analysis. And uh, just for a bit of a reference, the Eversight restrictions are restrictions that we determine in addition to the EBA guidelines. Uh, these can reflect and largely do reflect a lack of demand over this study period, time limitations for procurement, uh, geographic area restrictions, or different restrictions that we put in place due to age uh, in combination with different medical conditions. And the results here, uh, we have the number of total referrals and eligible donors in the graph on the left here. Uh, you can see for 2019, total referrals uh, were quite high and quite steady. And 2020 in March, we started to see uh, 
decent decline in the referrals that we were receiving. These are death notifications from our OPO partners, uh, reaching a real low point in April. And along with that, uh, we, can, we saw a uh, decrease in not only our total referrals, but also continued decrease in our uh, eligible donors overall. Uh, so ultimately over the study period, we had a 24% decrease in total referrals and a 34% decrease in eligible donors. Uh, interesting and, and very uh, critical and important piece of all of this is the decline in scheduled surgeries in the US. Uh, mandatory restrictions were put on elective surgeries and uh, were significantly reduced um, throughout this study period. So 2019, we have the blue uh, line graph shows where our surgery schedule, uh, surgeries were at for our service area. Uh, in 2020, we had a, a quite significant decrease over this time period. Uh, in March, 44% decrease. Uh, and in April, again, even more, 21%, just really, overall, we went down to approximately 10% of our overall normal activity. Uh, so this was uh, broadly impacted our donor outcomes and uh, the work that we do on a, on a regular basis. And the causes for the COVID rule-outs are displayed here, broken out by either a known COVID positive test, either before the uh, recovery took place um, or after a post-mortem test, uh, or the EBAA criteria of signs and symptoms or contact with uh, a potential uh, person that had, was known to have COVID. Uh, and then the Eversight rule outs, which again, uh, reflect uh, our own uh, contraindications or restrictions that we put in place um, to meet demand or to keep our recovery volumes similar to the demand that we're experiencing. And so as surgery demand went down in March and April and May, uh, we began um, not recovering on a significant amount of tissue and a significant amount of donors uh, to kind of level the demand with the amount of tissue that we were, uh, were making available. Uh, and you can see in June, interesting piece of this is 3% of those uh, referrals or rule outs were due to COVID, uh, positive COVID tests. And that's widely um, and broadly due to uh, more access to testing overall. And also when this is at the same time when we began uh, testing postmortem donors as well. So the postmortem testing over the uh, time period, we had 505 potential donors, uh, 60 of which were not recovered. 126 of those had a pre-mortem nasopharyngeal swab either at the hospital or by the uh, organ procurement organization, the OPO. Uh, 48 of those, don of those donors had a postmortem nasopharyngeal swab performed by the OPO and two came back positive uh, for 4.2%. Uh, 266 uh, postmortem swabs were performed by our staff, and 13 of those came back positive for 4.9% uh, rate. Overall, the postmortem testing reduced eligible donors by 4.2%. Uh, and we get to 4.2% uh, because testing is only one aspect of all of the uh, criteria for which uh, donors might be eligible. So. Uh, it's not in addition to that 4.9% 4, 4 that we see on that bottom right uh, box. Um, there, some of those may have been ruled out for other reasons as well. And here are some details on the 15 cases that tested positive. Uh, there's, you can see the cause of death is noted in each of those and the potential COVID sy symptoms are noted there as well. If a COVID test was performed prior to uh, the date of death, the interval between the date of death and that uh, COVID test is noted in the second to the last column. And if a medical director re was required to be consulted or was consulted, that is also noted 
in the uh, in the final column. Uh, the the uh, three uh, lines that are highlighted are tissues that were ruled out for other reasons, uh, not just due to the COVID test being positive, uh, but would not have passed through our standard uh, protocols for eligible uh, eligibility determination. An interesting note on this is that of these 15, uh, 12 of these would actually have been passed by the uh, passed through and made eligible for transplantation according to the EVAA guidelines uh, and according to medical director uh, consults. So we really do feel that the uh, postmortem testing is, is a strong and useful tool uh, in establishing and keeping and maintaining uh, recipient safety. So our conclusions from this work, despite our total referrals decreased by 24% and eligible donors decreased by 34%, uh, we did still see an, an exceeded amount of corneal tissue supply uh, over demand by 10 to 44%. Again, uh, with heavy restrictions of elective surgeries, uh, that's really where a lot of that came in. The EVA guidelines ruled out between 4 and 14% of the total referrals uh, to our iBank, and the postmortem testing reduced eligible donors by 4.2%. Uh, we do really feel strongly that iBank should consider routine postmortem testing uh, for COVID-19, that it is a strong tool and that uh, it should be more broadly adopted. I did want to also mention uh, our contributors and acknowledge our thanks uh, for, for everybody that has participated in this work. Dr. Mian, our medical director based at uh, the University of Michigan, Dr. Kumar at Wayne State University, Dr. Majmadar at uh, Rush University. Our funding sources are listed there. Uh, VRL Laboratories located in Denver uh, has been very helpful in the donor uh, testing, COVID testing. Uh, for both of these studies uh, that uh, Onkar and I presented, uh, and the OPOs of New Jersey Sharing Network and Gift of Life, as well as other iBanks, Miracles Insight Transplant Services Center, UT, um, and of course, our team that works every day in the Donation Support Center Recovery and uh, Research and Innovations for all of their work on all of this. And that is all I have. Okay, if there are no questions, then I would like to thank everyone again for joining us tonight. Uh, the webinar has been recorded and will be available on our website to view on demand. A special thank you to Ankar and Michael for serving as today's speakers and for providing us with your invaluable expertise on this subject. Have a great evening, everyone. <laughs>